Welcome, Wargamers, to the Steel Forests of Chamon, because today we are talking about the Iron Bark sub-faction of the Sylvaneth. If that sentence didn't make any sense to you, essentially, the tree folk of the mortal realms, the Sylvaneth, servants of the goddess of life, Alariel, like many factions in Age of Sigmar, have little sub-factions just to represent how that army, the Sylvaneth, looks in various contexts, how different they can be throughout the realms. The Ironbark are absolutely one of my favorite, and we're going to talk all about them, their origins, and what makes them unique today. Now, this is a new kind of sub-faction lore coverage today. Normally, I would just kind of group them together, like I'll do one video with three sub-factions and then a second one with the remaining three. But I wanted to do something a little bit different as I go back over some of these battle tomes that came out over the summer. So the way it's going to work now is we'll introduce the sub-faction, give an exemplary battle, that is to say, something from their battle tome that really exemplifies or represents, gives us a picture of what this sub-faction is like, what their values are, how they conduct warfare, whatever it might be. And then we'll throw in some other lore facts, places we've seen them, and of course end every discussion by saying, why is this cool? My favorite part of the show. But before we begin that, I would love to direct your attention to not just gaming over on the East Coast of the United States. If you're looking to do any kind of purchases for Games Workshop, they have tons of savings on GW products for any game, Age of Sigmar, 40k, 30k, whatever you want to do, but also a massive range of hobby supplies to do everything from custom bases, super cool painting effects, all these brands represented, the Army Painter, Green Stuff World, Gamer Grass, they're all awesome. Every time you use that link, big or small, each purchase goes to supporting me, my wife, our cats, all of it, and I'm so thankful for everyone for taking the time to use it. Now, for those of you who are new to Age of Sigmar and have no idea what I'm talking about, the Sylvaneth are the tree folk, these kind of sentient, almost ent-like creatures that permeate the mortal realms. I did a full series breakdown of them, I will have a link to that in the playlist down below. But one of the things that we're going to touch on a lot in discussing the Iron Bark specifically is that the Sylvaneth are a very almost reactive race, or malleable might be a better word. That is to say their, their temperament, their strengths and weaknesses can often kind of fluctuate based on where they are grown. If their seeds come out in a beautiful open field, well they might have a very chipper or positive or optimistic outlook on life, as opposed to say a super dark, you know, uh, no light penetrates the canopy forest in Akshi, where there'll be like a bent creature of the night that is also full of fiery rage. Like there's just a lot of different iterations of the Sylvaneth depending on kind of the nature of their environment. They really are a reflection of the world around them. And today, the sub-faction we're talking about, of course, is the Iron Bark. Now, if you have not picked up on already, uh, Chamon, which is the place I mentioned when the episode first started, is the realm of metal. So what does the Sylvaneth, a, a very like life-defining species, in terms of they, you know, they bring forests and, and creatures and flora and fauna with them wherever they go, what does that look like in a sort of largely infertile landscape, where the earth is full of rich minerals rather than, say, soil? I mean, it's just literally like hunks of metal and rock and gem. Well, to get us a sense of what these guys are like, I'm going to start off with an exemplary battle. This is called the Pact of Bark and Steel, and is listed in the newest Sylvaneth battle tome. A dispossessed throng, led by King Dorgo Bronzemane, arrives at their former hold in Chamon's Muzzlepar's Mountains. They soon discover the Karak infested by Grotz, who are using the halls to grow strains of huge fungi. Spitting Kazalid oaths, Bronzemane leads his warriors into the spore-choked depths, only for them to be slowly picked off one by one. Retreating deeper, the Duarden are surprised to be met by the glinting figures of Iron Bark Sylvaneth, led by a branch witch known as the Steel Root Dowager. The Sylvaneth have been attempting to purge the fungi from the mountain's roots for decades, but the tenacity of the Grotz shamans has thwarted their efforts. Through the knowledge of the Duarden's runesmiths and the steel craft of the Sylvaneth, the Steel Root Dowager and Bronze Mane are able to infiltrate long sealed foundries and open up sluices to send molten quicksilver spilling through the Karax tunnels. Though the majority of the hold is lost in the ensuing destruction, the loon cap mushrooms are eradicated. However, some Grot shamans escape with the knowledge of how to grow the fungi, and so the iron bark 
and Duarden resolve to work together until every such greenskin has been hunted down. Now I like that exemplary battle because it introduces some of the concepts I want to tack on here from the actual iron bark section of the battle tome. Not only does this grove exist in the realm of metal, Shaman, but they are actually descended from the first war grove to ever move from Giran into the realm of metal. So they are like have a very ancient lineage is what I'm trying to say. Now, one of the details in this story that does come up again in the Ironbark section specifically is this idea of glinting. When the Dwarden saw them, they first saw their reflections of metal. Well, that's because these Sylvaneth, even though the, the land, generally speaking, there are places where it's not this, but generally speaking in Chaman, the land is very infertile because it's very shallow soil. It's full of rocks, minerals, precious gems, all that kind of deal. But what the Sylvaneth who moved here learned was that if you just bore deep enough, there are minerals to be had if you can dig your roots down. Meaning the soil, it's not that it's a dead, you know, lifeless rock. It's just you have to dig and then get really good at like drawing up whatever you can. It is much more hostile of an environment than say Giran in terms of raw nutritional everything around you, but it is very survivable. And as they did that, the both the realm magic, meaning the longer you exist in a particular realm, you take on various aspects of it, like a subtle influence on you, but also the very literal, like what they are ingesting from the ground up begins to form them. I get the idea if you've ever seen uh, people put like color dye into water and then put a flower in it and you can make the flower turn various colors by altering the water that it's absorbing. It's the same concept. As they are taking in their necessary nutrients from the ground, it is affecting their very bodies. They begin to have bits of stone that have crawled up through the bark, precious gems. They almost have like a metal sheen to them. Their bark is like razor sharp. And so these are like some gnarly black metal trees. I mean, they're very cool. So that's their appearance. Now, another huge thing of note here though, is their, I'm gonna say amicability with Duarden. And this is a very specific to Ironbark thing. If you are a Duarden player, whether that is Fire Slayers or KO or a, you know, a Dwarven focused uh, Cities of Sigmar army, a very easy ally force for Sylvaneth, if you want to paint something different, is Ironbark. They have a long-standing history of really getting along with dwarves. And there's lots of reasons for this. One, if you remember the long lineage of the iron bark that I mentioned, they see those same values of honor and lineage and achievements from the past in the Duarden, which makes perfect sense, right? Dwarves love to talk about all the great things they did in the past and all those that they haven't yet fulfilled and whatever. So another thing that they really draws them together is their mutual respect for craftsmanship. The Sylvaneth obviously being a bit more on the primitive side in terms of technological achievements are amazed at the Duarden's ability to channel, you know, molten quicksilver and have all these crazy fortifications in place. But likewise, we get from the Ironbark lore section that the Duarden really respect the Sylvaneth's ability to craft steel, which is something you wouldn't expect when you read about a Sylvaneth arm. You're like, oh yeah, we can make well weapons out of wood and shoot arrows at long distances and whatever, but you don't think of like steel smithing. But this brings up another interesting fact about the iron bark specifically is they can organically mold steel. It's a very strange thing. Like almost like um, if you've ever seen any kind of sci-fi video where like people teleport and they like mold into the ship, like it becomes one of them kind of like clipping into reality. The iron bark can do something similar where like they can grow their roots into steel and then that gives them the ability to form it. So they're fascinating smiths is what I'm getting at. The way that the book puts it is they can blend wood with steel. And using this, not only do they craft incredible weapons, but also the iron bark have these incredible fortresses that are built like labyrinthian style, which is also a very Dwarden thing, right? Having these crazy defense networks they do the same thing and to the casual observer it just looks like really really thick brush like you're kind of being guided down a path you don't even know about but it's full of defenses and traps and all the alarms and everything it's just that they're all these strange ways of weaving nature together rather than uh, technological progress just a few other quick notes here from the battle tome specifically about iron bark some of the iron bark consider dwarden to be next to kin and vice versa 
And they were actually super pumped to hear that Grugni had returned. Because if you're in Shaman, whether you're a KO, a Carriage and Overlord, or a Fire Slayer, it doesn't matter. Like, Grugni being one of the Dwarden gods returning it is a big deal. And so if you have a lot of, I guess, built-in friendship and goodwill with a, a subsect of Grugni's followers, you would also be overjoyed for them. They went as far as to send an Ironbark ambassador to go to Azir and meet Grugni himself. Which is, it's kind of interesting, because like, I didn't know you could just walk up to a god. I mean, obviously these guys have a lot of clout because of their ancient lineage and, and whatever. It's just kind of an interesting thing. So, like, they're, they're very much in cahoots, I guess you could say, with dwarves, and I love it. And so let's start moving into why is this cool? I think the Ironbark are a fantastic representation of kind of like a counterintuitive sub-faction. So the Sylvaneth, as a faction, operate with like hit-and-run guerrilla warfare tactics. They're very dodgy. This plays in the table of them like, you know, teleporting around the table. They're kind of hard to pin. But this is a little bit different because it counters that by saying, but these are the tough ones. These are the ones whose like bodies have ingested metal for so long that they're axe resistant. You know, they're just, it's crazy levels of toughness from the lowest dryad to the biggest tree lord ancient. And sometimes to me, the most interesting sub-factions are the ones that kind of go against the norm, right? You say, this is how all the Sylvaneth are, and then you have that one little faction that's like, eh, I'm going to do my own thing. Now, obviously, one of the things I love is that they, they demonstrate for us how different life forms in the realms can be. Like, what life can look like. For other factions, like say for humans who move from one realm to the next, it may take quite a while for the essence of that realm to change them, to make them, you know, if you go from Azir to Akshi to become more fiery and impatient and ambitious or whatever. But the Sylvaneth, man, they had to adapt real stinking fast. And the fact that they, like, became really good at drawing their essence from the earth and having an immediate effect on them, because that's literally what they're ingesting, is cool as all get out. Now, one of the things I like, and it's kind of hard not to talk about it because it's a defining aspect of the faction, is just that they love dwarves, dwarden, whatever you want to call them. I like this idea of a sub-faction's kind of being a great place to ex express uh, different partnerships or allies or even, like, enmity between factions. Because, yeah, they're super pro, you know, dwarden, they love Grugni, big fans, got the foam finger and everything but they don't really care for anyone else being on their property. Like, they like the dwarves because they respect them, but that does not extend to anybody else. So, like, they are, they are a choosy friend and ally, which I like. It gives you avenues for fun modeling projects and additions to an army without feeling like everyone is just friendly and happy to work with everyone else all the time. Here's their core values, and hey, here's another sub-faction of everything that kind of fits in with those, and we can be unlikely friends. And the last little thing here I put that I like is, uh, I don't, honestly, I love sub-factions that don't have any particular units. I don't know if you've ever had this happen with a, with a Games Workshop book. You'll pick a sub-faction that you like the look of or the lore of, but maybe thematically they favor using a particular unit that maybe you don't like. And so, yes, you can always build your army as whatever you want, but there's that little part in your brain, at least it's in mine, that's like, I should have more of this unit that I don't like in there. Tell me in the comments if that's ever happened to you. But this is a great one because it doesn't have anything that they favor. It, whatever you want to do for your iron bark, yep, it's canonical. Go for it. I don't care. It's a little thing, but it does stand out. But friends, let me know your thoughts about the iron bark. If you play them or if you've painted them, please let me know. I would love to know like what you like about the faction, what drew you to them, whether it's the paint scheme, the lore, rules, anything like that. I'd love to hear it. And also, please, just for anyone listening, please let me know what you think about this new kind of style for covering sub-factions. Each one getting their own dedicated video, a brief explanation of the, you know, overarching faction that they're a part of, and an exemplary battle with some lore bits tacked on at the end. Always ending any very video with why is this cool? Give me some feedback in the comments below. Thank you all so much for watching and listening, and I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.